Tato Samma Sambudasa Nama Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambudasa Homage to him, the worthy one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one, we pay homage to him. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I know he's holy, the worthy one, but I don't know why I get stuck on holy all the time. <laughs> what that is anyway um let me tell you what happened uh, i i work I, I go every two weeks i get to attend a um this is a, it's really a funny story how it all happened but <laughs> but i but i was invited to come and attend where there are all these maha terrace from north america and sometimes bhikkhunis come in and they, many of them know me. They met me in Malaysia. They met me when I was traveling with Bhante and other, and other times when I was not with him and talked to Dhamma and everything. And one of them is a student, Bhante Kusala from uh, Toronto Temple. And he came to our center and learned how to teach Dhammas in, in English and had a lot of adventures with learning about power tools and <laughs> learning about uh, American equipment, how to build things and everything. And um, he helped with translations and taught us Pali. And I used to uh, do recitations, learn the recollections and things like that early, early with him. Well, every two weeks, these monks, they finally decided that they were going to have this. And they started it last year, I think in June. I think he told me they started it in March of last year or something like that. And they invited me to come in. He did invite me to come in um, and do this once every two weeks. And um, it's been really fun because I have to get up at three o'clock. Uh, it's women. I have to get up at uh, three o'clock in the morning and jump on the computer, splash my face get on the computer at 3.30 so that I can be at a meeting that is about uh, 6.30 for them in Canada and the United States, 6.30 PM, okay? And so <laughs> I always like it when I show up, she's all coming all this way. <laughs> and the reason they let me do it is because I'm from North America. And so uh, they let me in based on that. There's not other people coming from other countries because it's basically North American continent monks, you know? So they choose topics and every, uh, every other uh, week we have a topic and then sometimes it's a series now this one is going to be a series and um but i i got real interested I, this is silly the, i need to share this with you when it happens on the the tuesday that i tuesday morning i do it i need to use it then for wednesday so what i'm going to show you is the discussion that's happening now is the beginning of what's called the 10 recollections the Buddhist 10 recollections. And now, if you grew up Buddhist, you, you were definitely uh, exposed to some of these, which I'll show you on the list, it's very easy to understand. If you grew up Christian, you probably weren't exposed to these at all. If you came in as a visitor to Buddhism, you would some of them would make sense in the puja ceremony, you would be catching some of them. But the real discussion went in the direction of, um, because, because the leader, Saranapala from Toronto, Canada, is um, interested in the same way I am interested, or I'm, I'm interested the way he's interested in doing things that um, are subjects that matter to the people. And he believes in trying to get everybody active talking about how to be teaching and using the tools to teach Buddhism in a way where people are learning things they can use in life. That's that's a key factor that uh, it turns out there are a lot of monks that want to talk about this. Some of them don't uh, look at it th uh, that way. Uh, they, they think about it, but they stick with teaching in a very traditional way that confines it to a one group of information and it's repeated every week. And if you're not going to classes or not going to meditation, you might not learn a lot beyond that, that framework. So the recollections are, I did a paper, put a paper together for you and I'm gonna go there to, to kind of show you 
how it was set up for us. And I let me get it. And um, what I've done for you here in this in this page, if you went to get it before the talk, we, we set it up so you could go get it. <clears throat> Just to explain it. Um, it's the, the 10 recollections that are taught recollections practice. And this is a study sheet for the source guide support during the first meeting on this discussion. And um, it's held, like I said, bi-weekly monastic meetings by invitation only featuring North American monks and nuns respectfully investigating together on topics that matter for the people that will help you in life, that will help you to reduce suffering. There's all different kinds of subjects. We did four, four of these meetings, which was like almost two months long on mental health, for instance. That was one of the topics that happened for a while. This is gonna be, uh, be used for a little while now, this month and maybe partially into May, who knows. But now it's introducing a same topic a gradual investigation uh, by, that's what I'm doing, by Dhammasukha Meditation Center, Asian Regional Weekly Dhamma class is what you are, the Wednesday night class. And the topic is to be followed as covered every other week. So we can use this topic every other week for a while and see, see how much we get out of it. And if you don't want to do it, you should write me and say, let's do something else, really, because it's open to your interest. But this is if Turns out it's much more interesting than I thought it was going to be. I was I was kind of surprised at. Um, let's see, my, I have a funny, fussy computer, so I have to figure out how to do things here. Let's see. So over the next few weeks, we'll examine the use of traditional Buddhist recollection practices, and share the various uses for uh, the ten recollections in life. And we'll look into how these can increase Buddhist knowledge and wisdom affecting the six areas of advancement that we teach you in our retreats. So we have these six or eight topics that we weave together in our retreats that seem to have paid off. That's one of the brilliant things that Bhante Vimala Ramsey put together were these topics and how made them fit. Instead of isolated topics, they began to fit together and really help your meditation. Okay, so we'll look into how they can increase this knowledge. And I hope that, you know, you, you will uh, offer you some ways, additional ways to help people relieve mental and physical pain and suffering uh, that follows traumatic events in your life or old events that are sitting inside just begging for revenge and things like that. How can these things be helping us? So the one that we talked about in this meeting this week um, was really, we talked about the areas that, first of all, we looked at the areas, the six areas here that are the development areas that these affect, these recollections seem to improve in, in the study of Dhamma. So the first one is the Dhamma itself. And I gave you the references so you can personally go and you can check out the Samyutta Nikaya and Gutra Nikaya um, and the other references if you want to and, and see there, these are the kinds of recollections fall into these, these five groups. There are actually five groups. Okay. And um, then you add the governing principle is in there too. So the first one is Dhamma and the Nusati means the recollection and the repeating of something. And actually the Nusati, the Sati, this is a mindful recollection practice where you're repeating something to the brain again and again and again. And no, it's not brainwashing, it's different. <laughs> Somebody said, is it brainwashing? No, it's not that, but it, it is addressing the way that we can change our behavior and our personality patterns, our behavior patterns, and our minds. It's not just not. Remember, I told you Bhavana uh, that um, that uh, Dr. Premasiri in uh, uh, Paradinia University. He's the head of the Pali department. He went on a tour. And when he went on the tour, he started talking avidly, talking to people about the fact that Bhavana does not have to only mean development of mind. It can also mean, and be, you know, 
uh, legitimately translated to mean the development of your behavior patterns. Because if you develop your mind, that's how you change your behavior patterns. It's how you change an anger management issue into more patience, compassion, loving kindness, and that sort of thing, instead of having the anger management burst out. So this is the new sati part, the Dhamma first is looked at in this section, and then the Sangha, the recollection of the Sangha. Now this is where you uh, are touched by the puja. If you are doing the puja ceremony at a temple, you're used to hearing Dhamma Sarnang Sapa, you know, Budang Sarnang Gachami. And you're doing that, you're doing that repetitiously about the Dhamma, the, 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 um, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. So the recollections are recollections about the Buddha, recollections about the Dhamma, recollections about the Sangha, then also recollection of one's virtues and then recollection of one's generosity. And that's important because you remember when I told you that the way that we're, we're learning the practice is definitively really, really true. You know, it's definitive that it is a dana practice of generosity. You're learning not to just learn to give yourself metta, metta, pour it over me, you know, shower it down on me, and it's only for me, 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 me. <laughs> no, it's not that way. There's more harmony to it than that. There's giving what you are discovering to other people, yeah, and sharing with them and, and helping them to feel better and become happier in everything and uh, discover what you're discovering. So we encourage people to be teaching a friend, not teaching, but sharing with a friend or mentoring a friend, whatever you know and completely understand, you have that knowledge and vision. You share that degree of knowledge and vision with someone else. If it's making you happy, it can make them happy too, if they do it. So the Dhamma Nusati, the Sangha Nusati, the Sichila Nusati, the Ikaga Nusati is the generosity, and then the uh, Devata Nusati, which is recollection about the Devas, because they're our buddies. <laughs> you know, if uh, the Devas are around us, we need to learn about the Devas, remember the Devas. And, and uh, if you're dying, they tell me, if you, you look for the highest thing, the point, not being the most important, but actually physically, the highest thing you can see. So if you see a deva on the ground, don't look at that. If you see a deva that's floating in the air, okay, but if you see a deva on the ceiling or a deva on top of the church across the street or on top of a very high spot, if you watch that one, they say you'll go to a deva loka if you pass away, see? So the, this is the principle of the last thing that you see is probably going to help be an indicator to your brain where you're going to come back that consciousness it's imprinted will have something to do with where you come back if you do come back and have to pass through another life so this is the way it's set up the five the, and i say these are meditators tools i'm giving you this link here to access to insight has a very huge document now my document's not that big because what i gave you was the 10 points and I'm only, we're only going to talk about the beginning of this tonight. Okay, so what I mean is when you're talking about these recollections, how do they work? There was a lot of people talking some of the things they were talking about. Uh, what does it mean to have a recollection and to practice a recalling something is it is a continual thinking of the goodness, thinking of the wholesomeness, thinking of the anusati, uh, anusati sati, and establishing your mindfulness on that and then doing it again and again. So this is where people using the beads and people uh, re using the beads to repeat 108 times the same thing are trying to get it so the brain will be thinking about that the whole 24 hours while you're working today. And, that, and that's going to be a backup system for you to help you not get mad and burst out angry at someone or like that. Recollections, um, 
the first learn first thing you ever learn is Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And then you learn the Metta Karuna Mudita Upaka. That's the one that we spend a lot of time with that because we're working with it inside. We don't even realize we're doing a form of recollection work every time we do our cycle of meditation. We we are doing a recollection of the six R's and that is right effort, the recollection of this, the uh, six R's. And that is building up the strength of tranquility and wisdom and insights and a smooth meditation that keeps the process going. And it's a vehicle for us to take it out and keep it going in life. So then the Dhamma, Nusati, six qualities of the Dhamma is um, a really important one, but we read this first thing. One thing when you develop and pursue one of these, they lead solely to the, now each, the statement is in each one of these, lead solely to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to stilling, to direct knowledge, to self-awakening, to the unbinding. So these are what's happening as a result of practicing this way. So uh, what is happening in the brain is what I started talking about a little bit when it was my turn to say something for this session, because we can talk about it outside of this, but the neurocognitive science and the neuroscience is really validating for us today. It's, it's proving the way that mind can really learn. And when mind can really learn, it can wipe out an old pattern of misbehavior and replace it with a wholesome, helpful pattern of, uh, in the direction of patience and loving kindness and compassion and forgiveness and all of that operating instead in that neural pathway. Now, Stop for a minute and think about the brain because the brain is such an incredible machine in the human body. And uh, I was working for the head of a medical school in Sri Lanka, and he was talking one day to students, first year getting involved with his department, and he had 76 brains. That's his big claim to fame, 76 brains. <laughs> And they would study these brains and try to understand where everything is happening in these brains, um, where the electrical impulses are going and how everything is operating, the different parts of the brains. And the brain is actually responsible for operating the whole ship, your whole body. And so there are, inside the brain are parts that are basically helping every one of the organs in your body. And so when we allow it to relax and we, the thinking makes it heavy. And if we're, if we're doing too much mental proliferation in our mind, that's going to exhaust the brain and make you feel tired and wiped out and stressed, yeah. And that's because there's too much thinking going on, too much going on with the, with the wires for the brain, you see? And the brain, uh, when, what is happening to you when you do practice to experience clear mind or still point, even for just a few moments or in the part of your practice with, with tranquil wisdom and sight meditation, we say that there is a clear clear mind or a pure mind point, a still point that exists. And we figure it's about the size of the point on a straight pin, not even the flat part of the straight pin, the top of it, but so tiny where there is absolutely no craving at all. So where is that? If I could draw it for you, I would, I would do it, but I just have to explain it because I can't do that with this computer. Um, Okay, when you recognize there is tension and tightness in your mind, we don't wait to find out what the thought is, what the material is, what's all about or anything. We don't care. We're talking to you about the operation of the arising of tension and stress in your mind. 
as the tension and the stress is coming up in your mind, that's a sign there is something going to happen right clear, clearer for you to understand having to do with craving. It's coming. It's coming. It's rising up, okay, and it's starting to get tighter. When you recognize any part of that rising up tension in your body in an experience of talking, dealing, interaction, studying, anything, driving, that's the point where the signal is to start the six R's and let go, rec let go of it. And your mind, you just smile at it and you let go. As you relax, you're letting go of the tension that's left after you released it. There's still some subtle tension in there that you don't even, you can't even see where it is. But if you, you let go and then you relax and then smile between the relax and the smile, there is that tiny, tiny, tiny little point of no craving at all, pure mind. That is giving you a signal. That is what is the key component of the conditions that are right for you to be able to fall into cessation, into neurota, and feel yourself go out, that go feel yourself, let your brain stop, stop for a minute. And it's not even a minute, it's not a very short time, it's a very short time. But when perception feeling, consciousness shuts down for a tiny blink, and then it comes back on, what are you doing? Well, if we talk about this marvelous machine that is called the brain, we could say it's the human computer, and we could say we are rebooting the computer. So when we reboot the computer, it falls back more toward a default position. And the default position of your brain is calmer, more open. There's nothing going on yet again until it starts again, until it starts again. And of course, when we're practicing the cycle of TWIM, that's a very, very, very microscopic picture I'm showing you. You know, it's very, very microscopic. But the more you practice it, as the brain repeatedly experiences that tiny spot, probably it says something like, you know, wow, that's really a comfortable spot. I think I'd like to feel that again in this body. Can we get to that point again? And this is especially interesting thing for me in India because there's so much of the Vipassana practice and the Vipassana practice is paying a lot of attention to sensations in the body. And when those students make a determination that they really want to learn TWIM and are going to follow the instructions no matter what, very carefully, they are the ones who can get to an automatic, automatic 6 r happen faster than anybody else because their detection system is fine tuned Uh, the, uh, the detection is fine-tuned very easily. Uh, they can see this happening faster than the other students in a retreat. And um, how do we share the document, Ardika? You know? Am I sharing it now, right? Yes. Somebody said, can you share it? Well, we, we asked you, we said where to go to share it. Bunty, is Bunty here? You can explain. Yes. Somebody, somebody. Uh, I have shared it on the WhatsApp. Uh, you can uh, download the document uh, from WhatsApp or I can share the link over here. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I can say it. You see it? Okay. Because uh -huh. we tried to do it before. So. That one. All in all, these recollection, the idea of recollection Remember we said mindfulness remembers to do the six R and it recollects what to do for the six steps and it remembers to do all six steps each time. 
all five of them. There's actually five of them. Do the five steps and then repeat them again and again as they're needed, as you see the signs of the arising craving. So let's come back to this first thing it says here. It leads solely to disenchantment and then dispassion to cessation. So it's leading into eventually by using recollections and only having one thing happen in your brain. You know, if you do the nine qualities of the Buddha and you start doing that and doing it and doing that, even just saying Buddha Dhamma Sangha, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, we're on the way to do the college exam. <laughs> That's Buddha Dhamma Sangha, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Pretty soon that's all that's in there. That's all that's in there is just Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And you're saying, you're thinking of it as that's going to be supportive for me to be able to stay cool and calm and do my exam step by step and get a better grade. So one of the monks talked to us about the recollections first is the remembering of the Buddha and the, the Dhamma and the Sangha, then the Dhamma Nusati, six qualities of the Sangha, and then uh, the Sangha, recollecting the Sangha and doing that within the puja. The virtue is about the sila, it's about remembering your precepts. And when you're saying them every morning, you're recollecting them every morning when you do that. In a retreat, you're learning to, to practice that form of a recollection. And supporting, you have to support the virtue by keeping them all the time. Because what's so big about these uh, precepts is when you wound a person mentally, when you wound a person or they go through a bad experience, there is a scar, scar there. And the brain, it's not like, uh, we, we have a thing culturally, universally almost around the world that when we're crying, we need somebody to help us stop crying. But actually crying is a discharge system of an immediate threat to the human being that's occurred in some kind of event or when they got really upset or they cut themselves. You see mom grabbing the little kid and picking him up and saying, stop crying, stop crying. You'll be okay, you'll be okay becomes more important than the natural um, discharging of the tension in the body after you've had a cut on your leg while somebody's fixing it and putting bandage on it. Um, if you allow the child, we actually did a, an experiment with this in a house I lived with seven children in it and three families one time. We said, okay, when they got hurt and scraped their legs, we said, okay, these guys can cry and these guys can't. And we tried to see whether it healed faster. In our opinion, it definitely healed faster. But if the ch children were not allowed to cry at all and were hushed, hushed, hushed and given, you know, stuff for pain when it really was just the pain that was happening was the healing of the scrapes and stuff, it didn't heal as fast. So this is interesting. In homeopathic uh, remedies, in homeopath homeopathic medicine and natural medicine, uh, uh, the encouragement is not always there just to stop anything, but to listen to your body and sense your body in Ayurvedic medicine as well. So getting in tune with your body. So we're working to get in tune with our mind. We're practicing a, 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 a yoga of the mind, a form of yoga. And Ours has to do with precise witnessing to see how it works. So when we're using things, this is a tool and he's, they all were contributing. So I'll read some of the things they're talking about. How much you let go is what is so important. And um, the uh, reflection on death is if you go further, you get into the uh, reflection of death, I think is one that's included in here. I'm not sure, but I think it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mindfulness of death is number eight. And then let's go over the 10 of them so we can get a picture, a clear picture if you write these down. So the first one is the recollection of the Buddha. And when developed, it has that same 
classification on it leading to unbinding. And it's a support mechanism for this. It's not the end all and the only thing you need to do. It's not like that. Some, a lot of people come and think there's one thing we'll do it until it happens and that's it. There was a, uh, not only a choice for that one, but there was a combination that we're finding helps really a lot. Like when we're teaching you the different subjects that hook together. Uh, the next one was the recollection of the Dhamma, the Buddha Dhamma, and then the Sangha. That's the first three. Then the fourth one is the recollection of virtue, which has to do with the uh, sila. Okay. And then the next one is uh, the generosity. And the next one is the devas, the sixth one. And the seventh one is mindfulness of in and out breathing. And then mindfulness of death is the eighth one. And the idea of mindfulness of death is not all doom and gloom here. It's just seeing exactly what happens at the end of this lifeline. Death is part of life and that's where it, it ends here. It ends here, it started here, it ends. But it's part of the line. It's not detached from the line in some other thing, which is the way we seem to treat it when we get involved with death. The next one is uh, mindfulness immersed in the body, which is to under, this is calling, talking about satipatthana practice of the body in all aspects of understanding. One thing about our body is we don't get so afraid of everything if we know how it's actually put together. And I uh, have a, had students tell me, you know, I just don't have any fear anymore. And somebody would say, well, that's not a good thing. You need to have some fear. It needs to operate. But that's not the point. If there's fear, you say, well, there's fear. There it is. That's fear. It's here. Now I have to do what is essentially important to get out of the situation and keep my head straight. You don't succumb to it. It's like talking about grief in life. And some person can have grief and because they have been taught a reasonable amount about living and dying, they're okay and they can get through it in a short period of time. Someone else loses someone and is so devastating, they can't breathe, they almost can't exist. And they had no knowledge of death, no consideration of the actual truth of what the body is, what life is, all the different things involved in it, never took time to look at it. And then someone dies, it can be utterly collapsible, it just collapse, of, collapse on the person and feels suffocating. And at that point, they are overcome. That's the expression, overcome by grief. And so it doesn't have to be that way if we have been educated in understanding the truth about the body and the parts and the whole thing. Then mindfulness, uh, that's about the body. And then the recollection of stilling is number 10. And this one, this is one that when it's developed and pursued, it leads to the same thing. It leads into the deeper jhanas and the arupa jhanas and the, it gets you on path. All of this is a preparatory thing to help you get on path very, very clearly that way. Um, lots of talk about um, how much to do this and how, how to use it in a structural setting and going and doing your puja in the morning or the evening or taking your precepts in the morning? Can you get the important parts going about uh, the uh, remembering the precepts in your life for the day and for in your life to protect you? The precepts work as an umbrella. Remember, I told you it's an umbrella and here they come. These are the hindrances, all five of them or two of them or three of them together playing to whatever's happening. And the precepts are protecting you from them coming down on you. The idea of the umbrella is really a pretty good clear picture. Um, 
it was interesting to listen amongst these monks. They're usually in the room between 30 and 40 monks when they do this. And um, it, it was interesting that um, the difference of opinions on how to handle the precept, uh, handle, handle the hindrances, just one second because the water has to be turned off. Just a minute. Okay. And um, the most clear thing, once again, we can say about the hindrances in practicing the recollections and doing your meditation and living life all over the place, it's really worthwhile to take the time to be introduced to the hindrances, ask them who they are, and find out what they like to eat. <laughs> Okay, and what they like to eat, their primary nutriment they absolutely love, as much as double chocolate nutty ice cream, <laughs> they like your personal attention. They want it so badly, you know, and if you give it to them, they'll come back for more. I remember the nursery rhyme about uh, leave them alone and they'll go home, wagging their tails behind them. So I said to them once in one of my classes for Sunday school, you leave them alone and they'll go home and they'll take their meanness and their irritability with them. They'll take everything that feels like it's, it's coming to you. Because the truth of the matter is, if, if we look at hindrances and we we think of them as uh, we must attack the five hindrances. There was one person uh, really saw that we have to attack it. We don't look too closely at these English words revolving around this. And I, I spent some time with a Pali uh, scholar and, and asked them to show me that's the problem with talking about the words we use with the hindrances because the Pali words have different shadings of meaning. And, it, and what came to my mind was once I met a Frenchman and he said there were 11 or 13 different words for love. And I looked at him, I said, that's crazy. How do you deal with that? <laughs> but we actually have some variations, but we don't use the um, this, words we use are not as close in English, but the French have a whole dialect of talking about the different types of love my dog, I love the cat, I love my mother, I love the bread, I love the pastry, I love the cake, and I love this way and I love that way. And they have all these different words, you know? Well, the words could be part of what the problem was in, in this English translating time coming up and saying, we must destroy them. We must eradicate them. We must suffocate them. We must attack and we must crush them and subdue them. But then I, one of the early things I did with this was I went through the Majim and Nikaya, you know, we had snowstorms and got shut in and I just kept going through the whole thing and looked at all those other words that are in there, nobody talks about. Uh, which is basically releasing them. Abandoning them is the biggest one. When we talk, when we have 11 or 12 suttas that are dedicated to talking about the nature of the hindrances in the Majjhima Nikaya, if you go through all of those, no matter how they are stating the issue of what to do when the hindrance comes up, if we take a sieve and we shake it, you know, and it all comes out, all the stuff falls out, what's left in the sieve is abandonment. And the Buddha stresses again and again and again to abandon them. And when we go to the, uh, the, the one that was so impressive to me, that was in the early part, uh, early in the beginning of the book, it's only on number 22, Alagadupa Masutta, 
section six. And it's telling the monk who had a problem with this. He had a real problem with it. He was getting blockage all the time. It's the story of uh, Venerable Aratus' problem. And he really believed it was okay to engage a hindrance. Now, like Bhante Bimlarazi likes to say, he always likes to say, indulge in it. To indulge it is to start to pay attention to that instead of your spiritual friend and uh, move over to that hindrance and say things like, well, where did you come from? When did you get here? Why are you here? <laughs> and start to analyze why is the hindrance here my question was where is your spiritual friend don't you like that person do you not want to find out if you can send your frequency of loving kindness to them and have them start smiling and feeling good too are you not even interested in that no i am i am i am they'll say but they don't even realize they left. And then the ne next thing is, I told you to sit for two hours. I asked you please to sit that long and stay as long as you could with your, your uh, object of meditation, no matter where you are. And you come back and you say, well, I could only stay. I, I sat for the two hours, but I could only stay for a couple minutes with my my um, object of meditation, no matter what it was. And then I was pulled away. And what did you do? Well, I had to take care of that. <laughs> what does that mean? Take care of what? Well, I had to be sure that no, no tension and tightness was left in when I relaxed. I wanted to relax everything. That's a favorite one. So I started up here and I worked down to here and I went down my body. I, we didn't tell you to do that. Where did that come from? It's not in the instructions. The instructions that were pulled out of the uh, Anapanasati and uh, there's a few other places and then brought together and uh reflect very clearly that the steps involved are right effort and right effort is very clear you recognize the unwholesome mind state doesn't say take its license down find its name and address and everything and make up a form before you say goodbye stay away no 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 <laughs> it says let go of it don't think any attention on it anymore then immediately relax your head whether you you don't have to look for seeing what's in this head that's left in there just keep giving it the message i let go and now relax then smile to uplift and lighten yourself and as you come back to what your object is and keep going now that's being done in the framework of your meditation process but what happens if i go over there, if I go over over there and I start looking at the hindrance, have I left my meditation and started to do another meditation with the hindrance? And it involves, it's an analysis type of practice that I'm supposed to go and sit and find out exactly what everything is. But then that's totally against the idea that, and it's not our idea, it's the Buddhist strict knowledge about this the hindrances have nutriment they cannot have energy and be forceful and strong when they come unless they're getting nutriment what is the nutriment you go to the samyutta nikaya you go to 1597 page 1597 bhikkhu bodhi's translation of the uh samyutta nikaya it's in the bojanga samyutta read it very carefully mm -hmm. read it very carefully it is basically about the, um, the nourishment and the denourishment of a hindrance in relationship to the arising or the non-arising of enlightenment factors. That's what the subject is in a discussion on that page. And read the whole thing. There's seven enlightenment factors. And so whatever they say, they're gonna say it seven times. And then they're gonna show you seven times 
where if you pay attention to it, which is careless attention on the, the uh, hindrance or the obstruction, then what happens is the enlightenment factor of investigation cannot arise. And then they'll tell you the enlightenment factor of each one of them, mindfulness, energy, joy, and then the tranquility, concentration, and wisdom. They'll tell you, if you pay attention to the hindrance, those cannot come up. And what has to happen before you can fall into cessation? What is it that happens before you can move into just cessation? Let's say the cessation of the uh, second jhana before you move into the third one and the cessation of the third one before you move into the fourth one. It doesn't need to be that I'm talking to you just about Naroda. It's the cessation of stress and tension long enough that you can move to the deeper level and you start up here and uh, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, but you have to fall over into it. You cannot, if you want it, you cannot have it. If you want to control it, you cannot steer it. You can't. Once you are familiar with it and your brain is operating and communicating with you at that point, you can say things for determinations, but even determinations have their trap. Yeah, even they have their trap. If I say, I will sit in the second jhana this morning when I go to work for the whole morning of working until lunch, do you think it'll happen? Nope. Because you, you ordered it. I will. See, I will it. I will. Yeah. If you say, I want to sit in the second one uh, for the morning, it'll make me do better work at the office. I want to be in the second. Probably it won't happen. But if you say, when I get to work, I will sit, I will sit no higher than the second jhana through my morning work. I will sit no higher than. Do you hear the difference in that? It's tricky. I'm not asking and I'm not demanding and I'm not ordering. I'm just saying I'm gonna go no higher than the second jhana and I'll pleasantly do my work. See what happens, yeah? try it. It's, it's been tested by a lot of people. And it really, truly is very precise. Coming back to the recollections, what happens is that they say, uh, when you are thinking about the, uh, the hindrances, okay, uh, in order to overcome them, What's really important is that if you think about attacking them, you are asking for a war for a warlike concentration confrontation, a warlike confrontation. Now, the way to if you feel they are the enemy, if I, I once I once did a talk in Malaysia to 40 retired soldiers. <laughs> and I sort of was a military a military wife for a number of years. So I was exposed to a lot of stuff about strategy and the military and all kinds of stuff. And I decided I wasn't even going to talk to them in reference to this the way I usually do. I said, okay, let's say you take the hindrances to be your enemy and believe you must attack them. What says the Art of War about this, the book, The Art of War, <laughs> which everybody uses for their strategy. What Will you succeed? You, you won't. You, usually you won't. It's very rare if you do. But the, in The Art of War, there's 10 lessons. And one of the just key ones about how to beat the other guy and beat the other army and, and not um, destroy the land at all. I mean, this thing that's going on in Ukraine, I'm looking at the pictures thinking, well, they did that. And that I wonder if they're going to rebuild the whole thing. There's a beautiful area, beautiful neighborhoods, beautiful buildings. And only took two or three weeks to just, my gosh, it looks like the end of World War II over there. And are they, what, who's going to, 
build all that up again, you see. So you destroy everything and they didn't kill as many people as they would have in, in the old days. A lot more people would have died, but there were a lot of soldiers that died and there were a lot of civilians that died in this thing. So those people, if you win the, country, win the territory in a game and, and then you get to control the territory, what good is it for you? It's all destroyed. Well, in the art of war, it was very clear that was a dumb thing to do. And that the master strat strategic commander, what, the winner of the game was the one who could figure out ways to spy on the other side, figure out how to trick them and win you know, that way. But the biggest solution was to cut off the supply chain to the army. Yeah. So when I think of that, I, th I remember that. I think, well, if a hindrance comes up, why should I attack it? Why? When the Buddha has given me express, repeated information not to ever engage an obstacle, because if you have an obstacle you think is there, if you, the, you think it's an obstruction, it, it, it'll only become an obstruction if you personally pay attention to it, is what he said. So don't ever, engage a hindrance period and in in uh you know um say the naval academy or the army academy training commanders once we tell you that then you you lose points on the exam or you lose points on your strategy games if you ever try and do that when you could have won if you simply cut off the supply routes if you cut off the supply routes to an army what has to happen is they they run out of food and they have to go home they can't live on the land in most of the places where they go to have these confrontations so the best thing is to cut off the supply chain and they have to leave and that's what happens so the buddha was you know, actually living, I don't know if he was living the same time as Sun Tzu with the art of war, but he was living in a similar time to the writing of the Tao. And the Tao has similar information in there about the ruler of the world. He's smart. He's not gonna go and take these people into armed conflict when he can win in other ways you see well there isn't any reason for a person to get on the front and decide we're going to attack and fight and try to destroy annihilate eradicate suffocate and subdue something if we know that the food is our attention then we should just abandon it relinquish it release it, allow it, and remember one other player in the game, Anicca. Whatever comes up will always pass away. So Anicca has a lot to do with everything. So when you're caught at work, you're caught in the office, you're caught at school, and you're troubled because you're of this conflict of thoughts and it's a mental proliferation inside your head it feels like it's there and it is it's pushing about the future and the worries about that's pushing about the past and what i should have i could have i would have done if you find yourself in that mental proliferation loop you should be able to identify it from the training that we're giving you because those things are going to cause a tension and a tightness it's going to come up that's where you need to be letting go, relaxing, smile at it. It came up, but it doesn't have to be a problem. Even if bad things happened, to get through it, the strongest thing you can do is to stay in that present time period as you're moving along. We, we had a new joke about that, was like, um, you know, 
don't get out of the car. I think it's what we were, this one guy said. So you're saying, don't get out on the car. I'm saying, look, we gave you this car. Here it is. We gave you this car and it's going along and that's the present time and it's moving along. Has a beautiful windshield. There's a little windshield you can see out. <laughs> and you can see as you're going along. So why get out of the car? And for heaven's sakes, if something does get bumpy over here when we're going along the road, don't get out and put it in your car. Don't put it in the trunk and carry it with you. Just leave it alone. When, it's, when an event is finished, you tell me. Is there still energy from the event that just happened? No, the energy was used up in the event. So if you get upset now while you're sitting there about something that happened this morning or happened yesterday or happened last year, if you start reliving that and thinking about it, are you reliving, turn, reliving, are you using the energy is the question from the past to recall the event and get upset about it? If you look closely, that's not what's happening because you probably were asked by me and you probably agreed with me when the event happened, then the energy was used up and then it's back here. It's not going to be active again. It's just there, it's, it's done. So you're, you're still moving along the road in front of you. Those things up here, are those things up there are not here yet, are they? So if you're thinking about the future too much and worrying about it, what might happen, what could happen, et cetera, and so forth again and again and again. Well, that energy from the future is not there yet. So you must be getting energy from somewhere. So where could you be getting it from? The problem for you is you're opening up uh, this little car. Yeah. And you're taking energy from here and trying to use it for this back here or this up here. So when you get home that night, your car is just barely getting home to park in the driveway. It doesn't have any, any energy left in it, does it? <laughs> what are some of the things you could have done to calm yourself down when you're frightened? Uh, Bunty uh, Kusala was saying when he grew up, his parents used to teach him even if it's just Buddha Dhamma Sangha, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, you're thinking of higher things than where you are and what you're going through. And that's good. My bell, bell is ringing. Be right back. <laughs> things I didn't get to here, but um, what they basically were saying in the beginning of the discussions about the recollections is that they are a balancing tool for the meditator, for the lay person, concerning anything that threatens the, the mental system, anything that causes tension and tightness by stepping back for any length of time. 
and just doing uh, using the mala beads to do the era, you know, the 12, uh, I'm sorry, the nine qualities of the Buddha to do those in, in repetition for a while calms you down, steadies your mind, steadies your body, calms everything down. So it's a, it's a supportive tool mechanism. One person asked me, is it a ritual? I said, well, not really. Um, it's not really. You need to tell me what you think about that, but I don't think it is a ritual. It's not that you're, you're doing this to as what's going to take you someplace as much as you're doing it in cooperation with your brain, understanding if you go back and disconnect a lot of the wires running and busy for the whole body and get down to just a few, you get very peaceful and very quiet and very helpful for your body and helpful for your mind. So this is a support tool mechanism thing. And this is why it helps so much. Yeah. Okay. So let's go. Let me go back and, and um, open up the floor. See what you think about this. Uh-huh. Comments. <laughs> Hello there. Hello, sister. Can I just get, give them, um, I got a few, a few comments uh, around this because one of the, one of the things that strikes me is that with, with the pr proliferation of, of general mindfulness, um, it's, it's very much a, around, uh, in many respects, a, a fix-it approach. So it's done. It's done for an outcome, and and one of the outcomes often that's described is calming and de-stressing and and this sort of thing. And <clears throat> when I was reflecting on this a, uh, a few days ago, uh, and the difficulty of how this is being applied in 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 the work environment or in business. Uh, it struck me that a lot of uh, the mindfulness is uh, about, uh, it's much more about um, acquiescence rather than uh, developing action. And I think the important distinction from the Sangha point of view is to emphasize that the purpose of the mindfulness is, or the other practice is for action, to, to precipitate change, to uh, uh, cultivate a, uh, a different environment. And I think one of the things that would be really useful in this, in this type of presentation is to see how, we, how this extends out into the realm of action, not just in the realm of, of calming down or, or this, that. Now, that's, that's the first step. Uh, because and mental clarity. Because then right. then right. you get mental clarity, and then from mental clarity comes the understanding from the practice about how to how to move forward, um, and how to be uh, progressive, if you like, around um, uh, what's happening. Um, when I've discussed uh, mindfulness, bringing mindfulness into companies, I, I, I've always said that. If mindfulness works well in a company, it should precipitate change, uh, not just efficiency or um, uh, a, uh, a, a superficial a superficial happiness or, or calmness around things. Um, and one of the things that struck me with these six areas of advancement, uh, oh, I think we've lost Sister Kina. Uh, Hello. What, what happened? I think uh, she got disconnected. I think that might have been the case. Yep. 
Okay, I'll just check. Okay, she joined. <laughs> uh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Or went out briefly. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, you know, this is a very important thing when you talk about acquiescence. Um, myself, having struggling, I guess. A lot of people are struggling <clears throat> right now in the world trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And um, some people say we're going through a whole shift from one age to another. And they talk about that quite a bit. And that's a rough scene because we don't, doesn't happen, but every once, every 25,000 years. And so very difficult to shift like an S, you know, astronomical type of thing like this uh, astrological shift like that i don't know what you uh, what i should say to people for instance right now in regards to what should i say to the children how should i explain to them everything that's going on right now how can i tell my children what i went through this with the vietnam war i went through this with desert storm i went through this with other things when my kids were growing up now here we go we've circled around i went through the cold war um working in the peace movement and stuff in relationship to shutting down this dismantling them and the salt talks and everything else if that didn't pan out very well <laughs> come to you know reset up a treaty many years later and get to the part describing the instruments that you shut down and they simply say well we can't renew it because uh, the descriptions are all wrong now and then they don't want to look into the fact they have a new generation of the same kind of crap. <laughs> you know, what, I, what is this about? You see, oh. how do you explain this to young people? And they think their parents aren't doing anything. And they look, mm -hmm. I, we, we struggled with this in the peace movement to try to get people to understand you need to sit down at least one day a week and write letters to your senators and your representatives. Well, what can letters do, they say? But you don't understand those representatives are interested in one thing and that's a constituency who will keep them in office and if you write one letter you know it represents six thousand ten thousand twenty thousand depending on your population other people that are thinking the same thing and maybe we should pay attention <laughs> but i i don't know what what do you think what should we tell them well i i, I think what, what we're facing is the nature of samsara that, that it is this variable thing. And that when, uh, uh, when perceived advantage reveals itself to certain people, they, they try to pursue it. How, however it is, it's, it's the, it, it, it is that toxic mix that, that makes samsara an unsatisfactory place rather than a, a satisfactory place. Um, and the nature of samsara is this variability. It doesn't follow what would be uh, um, for want of a better description, perhaps a sane perspective. Uh, it, it, it panders to and, and is exploited by these sort of micro insanities uh, that people feel are advantageous. Uh, it, it is an adventitious oh, we're environment. Talking, we're talking greed, hatred, and delusion here. Exactly. <laughs> that's, exactly. That's, that's the whole thing. It's Lobido Samoa. Uh, that's yep. what greases the wheel and just keeps it turning. And yep. now that we, we live in a, in a world of titanium, you know, there's no hope that that wheel is going to break because now we have a new kind of rim on it, titanium. <laughs> and when they built those dirt bikes, they built those dirt bikes, you know, you remember dirt bikes, 
they took all the metal away and they came up with a new kind of plastic that can't be destroyed and those dirt bikes yeah. if that's what's in the wheel we're in double trouble <laughs> I mean, part of, part of it is that we have to remember that um, that samsara, or certainly the our presence in in this realm, in the uh, in the human realm, is still the most adventitious one because it does show us the two extremes, and so it shows us the benefit of the teaching. This is one. this is one thing that came out from some of the monks stressing that we should make sure that we say to the audience, and they spent a little while explaining. And we were all sitting there, basically, I wasn't taking notes, and I was just going, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, right, which is that we are gifted, we think everything, we think we are damned, because what is going on, mm. in, a, in effect, though, we are gifted because we, the animals don't know what's happening, the mm. horse, the cow, the, everybody else, they don't know what's happening, you see, it's pathetic, we actually see can see both sides and a, a lot of people will run to religion at this point but a lot of people will run away from it at another point they will step away from it because they'll get disappointed nobody's coming down here to fix this you know that's where i was uh, i can remember taking walks when my friends were dying in vietnam and just taking long walks and say i don't get it why don't you come down here and fix this you see all this stuff, you know, that we learned in Sunday school. I, tell me what's happening here. But we also need yeah. to make sure people understand, if you like, the importance of right effort. Uh, because, you know, exactly. that is what, you know, it's not that this situation is irredeemable, but it's that the right effort needs to be made. And the right effort can only be made, you know, from the individual to the collective rather than uh, you know waiting for the collective governments or whatever to to decide what is what is right effort so it's an empowering situation as well as a despairing one it's we've always got these balances between the two um, and I that know. brings me on to the the recollections that you mentioned and you know the some of these um uh, some of these require already some commitment to the path. I mean, recollecting the Dharma, recollecting the Sangha, recollecting... Um, but remember, remember though, Dharma can be extremely simple. Yes, yeah? simple this, is, this is the point I'd like to make, uh, yeah. that, that the presentation needs to be recognizable um, exactly. by the, the people, the people that it's yeah. being addressed by. It cannot I mean, imply. It cannot exactly. imply that there's a level of faith already, or there's a level of 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 uh, of understanding. So things like the virtue and the generosity. These these are these are really really good because they are things that you can do for yourself, and and they exactly. change your relationship to, to to what's going on, and the mindfulness of breathing, and. Uh, um, and, and maybe even the the, the contemplation around uh, and uh, uh, the, I don't off. I don't exactly I don't exactly know why, but the meta the Brahma Viharas aren't listed in the recollections. But in fact, when you are practicing the Brahma Viharas, mm -hmm. it is a form of recollective practicing the whole structure of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So, the, so, so, so aspects of these, when they're presented very simply and not uh, assuming a sort of integration into the, the uh, assigned up Buddhist perspective, but simply presenting it in the way that the Buddha uh, dis, uh, presented the reality of what it is to be a human and, and a human mind and cognition and, uh, and all of that. So the perspective of being the social scientist, uh, exactly. rather than... Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, but I think that that, yeah. that 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 I think is very powerful, and you know, sila is very important. And you look at you look at uh, many of the representations of mindfulness in the in the secular environment, and we don't see dana, we don't uh, generosity, we don't see sila, we don't see the impact. No, you know, of, that's of, a shame uh, too. You know, there's a lot we work. were crossing. We were driving across the country several times in 2004 and 2005, and we would go to many uh, meditation centers and temples and things. The meditation centers, they have a, you know, picture 
on the walls. I think they all had a big conference and they have the same picture. <laughs> and it's a little framed thing, uh, like a blessing for when you're a traveler. And, and what it says is a little statement about tradition. The tradition is, and they'd ask you for the money to give the money to the center to make this center go on. But there wasn't a word in it at all about generosity, you see. There wasn't any story telling you where the tradition came from, how it came up. They sterilized everything. It's all like sterilized. Yes. Like they have an autoclave and they run everything through the autoclave and sterilize it and then they give it to you. And um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a travesty. And then in, in UK, I heard that there was actually a, the judge who was very smart. He started laughing and dismissed the case. <laughs> <laughs> but the man came and wanted to um, preserve the uh, MBSR system as the definition worldwide for mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And you now the, the defense against that was someone Buddhist who said, well, wait a second, wait a second. What you're trying to say that you are the mindfulness, and we're talking about a mindfulness that actually has results described all over in the place in the text, and you're talking about this other thing you created. But the judge thought it was hysterical that they wanted to take this word for this product. On a Friday night. Each week. That's what really blows my mind. It can be as expensive as $1,200 for one cycle of that. And I don't know if you know the one set of research, but this is the one where I just didn't ever want to look at research about this again after I saw this. I was done. I just thought it was so funny, you know, and I thought, what are they doing? You know, the one group was the charging that, and um, they took a bunch of people who didn't have good skills with socializing, and part of their life was almost agoraphobic, where they close themselves in and they never go out to see anybody. And so, 10 weeks, uh, I guess it was um, eight weeks of this program, they measured, had a measurable way. Uh, for a measurable outcome of checking these people to see if they were now behaving differently at their jobs and at homes and stuff because of this MBSR program. Well, the control group were going together and having tea and talking to each other in someone's house somewhere else once a week for two hours, and they measured them. And it came out almost identical. And the thing was, they didn't have to pay $1,200 again to keep going their Friday night to have tea, is what the woman said about it, you know. But these other people, in order to keep going after eight weeks, they had to pay $1,200 again if they were going to go. But this is, this is like, come on, that's, if that's what's happening. <laughs> and apathy and acquiescence are very dangerous in this world right now. And I think it's, I don't know what the next, I, I lost track. Who is the present? Maybe Ardika, can you tell me who the present generation are called? Who are they? <laughs> you know, you've got the generation X and generation, what's generation are we in now? Do you right. know? Right now? Yeah. Yeah. What's the generation? Z. Z? Z. I think it's more than Z. <laughs> And more than Z? <laughs> How do you get more than Z? <laughs> it is Z generation. <laughs> Maybe that's it. I'm not sure. What is it, the, the generation now? Uh, they're saying it's alpha generation now. <laughs> alpha? Alpha. 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 Well, alpha would fit if we're in a, Aquarius has just started. If you want to have some fun, you look up the, the beginning date for Aquarius. <laughs> it will take you all night. You know, they have universities trying to figure it out, astronomers trying to figure it out, uh, people who are planetary <laughs> experts and, and everybody. And it could be that it started this year. Who knows? It could be that Bonte responsible for starting it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. 
you know, but, but this whole thing is like, um, it's, it's all, they, they will dress differently. Uh, this, I think I may have said earlier here, you know, the skirts go up and the skirts come down. I don't know if I was talking to you or somebody else earlier. Um, in the 1920s, my grandmother had a flapper dress and it was like short shorts, very, very short with, with fringe on it and everything. Someone stole it out of the basement. We lost track of it, but I did see it one time, but we never had a picture of it. Also, in the 1960s, when they came out with two-piece bathing suits, this is not bikini, uh, not, I'm sorry, not, not bikinis. <laughs> it's not, not, not bikinis. I'm talking about two-piece bathing suits that are like, you have this much bare in the middle of your body and you, it's like a pair of shorts and a, and a top like underneath a sari almost. And that, that was the earliest ones. My grandmother said, I could not go out of the house with that. <clears throat> I could not go to the beach with that. I was 16 years old. I had one of these and I was not allowed to go down there. Unless I covered myself completely with a towel and someone took it off so I could go swimming and put another towel on when I got out to lie down on the beach. I said, this is ridiculous. <laughs> you know? And then my sister said, well, it is ridiculous. You know why? And I said, what? She said, let me show you something. And we went out in the garage to my grandmother's old clothing trunks and pulled out a dress that had no back, no back. <laughs> and and she, uh, we went back and said, how do you explain this? <laughs> and you're upset because we want to, you know, we want to, the, the, the shoulders on this bathing suit were like this wide, you know, up like this. And came like right here to my neck and it was just so funny finally my grandmother said okay here's the deal if you take these three dictionaries big dictionaries put them on your head and you can walk up those stairs to the upstairs and down again in proper posture i will allow you to go to the beach i think what happened is my mother told her that she had to she just had to knock it off you know but my grandmother was going to have the last word so I just put everything on my head you know, like this, and I just went right up the stairs and right down the stairs and went to the beach. But what I'm is the sinning the fashion, what I'm trying to say to you guys is <clears throat> I never really documented the men's fashions, but uh, the women's fashions, they just go like from the shorts in the 20, the short skirts and then they started going down and down to the knees and below, just below the knee, mid calf and down to the floor again. Yeah. And then they, and, and then they came back up again and then they went down again <laughs> and the sixties came, they were coming up again. It's a circle. This is where we started this conversation earlier tonight by talking about the roundness of things. And uh, this is the, the thing on the earth is that anything alive is, is has this roundness look at this roundness <laughs> you know? and i have round veins and the blood wouldn't go through them if they was think about the i think i said earlier think about the wheel of samsara i said to ardika you know what how did they figure why did it have to be a wheel i thought now i was playing around with that one night and <clears throat> if it wasn't a wheel and it was square and another square like this. It, just imagine your life, your poor brain going through uh, 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 <laughs> to process everything in your brain because you can't do it because everything has to spin so fast, so incredibly fast. And maybe, maybe it's true. One man wrote an article that actually this planet's just a prison planet. It's a place where they put people from all different worlds. They dump them off here. They have to be born into this world and they have to figure things out. They can't get off of this planet and into another world until they figure stuff out and how it works. Then we must be in the right place because the Buddha has so many answers and, and he's not going to hang it on one person to provide it for us. He's telling us we're individually responsible. Hey, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, question, I think. Yeah? I do, yes. Well, actually, it's, it's, um, it is a reflection rather than a question. But in, in the context of um, 
looking at these reflections and how they're very supportive for, for everyone and, and particularly how to make it the, the teaching relevant in lay life. And one that really, um, well, lots of them may make, they all make sense, but one that just jumped out. <laughs> It's freezing again. Are we frozen? It is okay. the generosity. And um, um, I, was, I was reflecting on, I suppose it's, it's really from personal experience of, of, of this, this being a real direction of learning. It's not often modeled very successfully. So we can have um, presentations of generosity that are either, um, what should I write down actually? <clears throat> yeah, they're not modeled in a balanced way. So we don't really know how to be generous to ourselves. Um, and That's we sad. can either have a, a sort of, we can arrive at, at, at a, oh, a wanting to learn something with very judgmental patterns. So we don't have an inner generosity at all. But we can also have, um, a very public generosity. This is something that I think has become very prevalent in this culture and very different, I think, from when I was a little girl in the 70s, uh, where there was much more private giving and you, you didn't necessarily announce that you were doing things. Um, ah, it's the, the man, today, the man, it's, the man it's, who prays in the closet. Like, yeah. Say again? The man who prays in the, in the closet. Yeah. Is the, Beloved, beloved of the Lord. Okay. He never okay. comes out of the closet. He only, he prays all the time, but no one knows it or yeah. sees it. Yeah. And I think, you know, both, both you and I have talked about having um, some, some experiences with our families where there was very private giving. No one ever knew that happened. And, and today it's almost like it's, institutionalized presentation of doing something good. So I'm not saying that this is this is a, 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 a wrong thing of itself, but it's the way that it, it, the culture has lent so that everything is, there is an affirmation, there's a public feedback, there's an announcement, and there's a, a, a kind of a trade with the generosity. And it, it, it kind of, so we've got this sort of judgmental and then there's the traded. And then the other side is the, is the kind of the, the pampering, which is, is some of the phraseology that's, I mean, it's old fashioned now here, but the me time. Um, so it's the giving of myself treats to make myself feel good. So I suppose that feeds into something a few, it's not the same. Well, um, one, of, yeah. one of the pieces, one of the pieces for uh, giving the gift is interesting the steps for giving the gift is described in the text and there's a series of pieces to this the person first uh, sees you and has a good feeling and wants to give you a gift and then the person should be smiling and feeling good when they go and find the gift and then they should be smiling and happy when they're wrapping the gift and then they should feel are happy when they are giving the gift to you. And then they should feel good about it afterwards. This, that's feeling good about it afterwards isn't a problem. It's like the more blessed you give, the more you will receive. And you, you also uh, so recollect the, good the more blessed it, it, the more women blessed it is to the, what how did that go? The more you give, the more you will receive. And one of the things I was actually um you know, talking about when I was working with the Christian group was that that is actually a pretty universal teaching tucked in to many, many, many religions. But we are in this ridiculous period of extreme stuff. I mean, just stuff. I wish I could see my desk. <laughs> I mean, it's a disaster. And, you know, I go to Japan and when I come back from Japan and come home and in Japan, you go to stay, they put you in these really beautiful places to stay, but no matter where you stay, you go in the room, <clears throat> a perfect chair, perfect bed, perfect table and one vase of flowers and that's it. 
There's no gaudiness to anything, no excess anywhere. Everything is so clean and crisp and comfortable. When you come out, I, I managed to build this place with no closets. <laughs> and in the Western world today, <laughs> think about that a minute. I don't know about England, but in America, if you're coming to take a look at a house where the people are still living in it and you want to consider buying the house because it's for sale, if you go inside, just don't ever, don't ever just walk up to and what's in here and open the door. And it might be a, one of those closets that have everything you don't want people to see that were given to you you're never going to use and it's been in there for 15 20 years and it's packed from the floor to the ceiling if you open the door it could be suicidal <laughs> yeah but but some cultures it's not here i mean in this in this quarter uh, can i uh, say something about giving the uh, yeah. uh, see, uh, Buddha has a very kind of a comprehensive uh, uh, kind of idea about giving. So uh, uh, there is a kind of a uh, whom you are giving to and how you are giving to are also oh, that too. But uh, yeah. uh, whatever giving you do, even in the uh, sense of public giving or giving uh, for uh, our own uh, name, everything has a merit. Buddha says that even if the food which is left over on your plate, when you throw that food, you throw it with a mind saying that let this, whoever is the, uh, the creatures are there, let them eat this uh, food and you throw away your leftover food, that also has merit. So uh, thinking that uh, if somebody is giving uh, in uh, a fashion which is public or in a way that he wants to give uh, to a uh, 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 garner uh, praise for himself. Those kind of giving also has merit. So uh, uh, there are certain cultures kind of which uh, say that when you are giving uh, for something uh, like a selfish motive, you don't get uh, merits from that. That is not what the Buddha is saying. Buddha is saying that any kind of giving you give, even the leftover food if you are uh, throwing away, with the mind that let uh, whatever animal is there or the creatures are there uh, partake this uh, food, that also has merit. So we have to understand that uh, from a Buddha's perspective, the giving is a very important thing. That is, it is in Dana Shila Bhavna. And it is also a part of the relinquishment of uh, this thing, our attachment. <laughs> it is linked to those uh, relinquishments of our attachments. So any kind of giving is good. I think, uh, so we can say that not giving and giving. Uh, uh, so whenever you are giving, it is always good. In whichever manner you give. I think it's, that that's is. good. That's really good the way you explained it. Thank you. Yeah. You got anything else, Sarah? I think that, uh, that, that, was, the, that was the one that jumped out um, because I think it's so very practical and, and relevant. To, to have the guidance around how, how to work with generosity in, in daily life. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's, that's really good to explore that. And I think it's a good access point for people who don't necessarily even want to touch on any religion. Um, it, it's, it's a very, um, but it's an area I think we can be confused about either because of what's been modeled in the past or modeled in our culture and, so people, we can just end up not knowing how how to do it. Or and the access point, of course, to 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 the the twin teaching is this the generosity to ourselves, which I I feel is very much the that we get through the six R's, the effort that we're making, how we look after ourselves, how we cultivate that kindness, the forgiveness, and the compassion. That that's a really um, generous way of being, but it's also quite tough it's not the acquiescent way it's very much uh, it is an action orientated way because we have to to see um see these hindrances and look after them that's true that's true the the um the apathy and the acquiescence to things i don't know the um it's kind of interwoven what um, Hugh was saying before about the acquiescence, because 
when I what I mean by interwoven is how did we get to this place where how did we get to this place? where both people just feel compelled, they have to be working and the kids don't have parents for so long until they get to school. How did we get there? And uh, the cost of housing and everything, I, I don't know. There's not that support structure uh, for the children to have their parents around them I think right uh, Sarah now. has to leave uh, now, uh, kind of here, she has to pick up her uh, children, I think so. so. So I don't know what we ever do to, to basically balance that out. Um, maybe, I mean, I, what I saw happening in Poland was just, you just wanted to cry. I mean, it was so beautiful. It was almost like the, it was an interesting way they handled it <laughs> because um, the Polish government opened its arms to catch the Ukrainians when they migrated over all the, the and took them into their homes massively, brought them in. Similar languages, not that was one thing, not such a terrible problem. But then immediately on the air said, and we'll need $800 million to make this work. <laughs> you know? And they, but they'll do it anyway because of what's happened before with the Russians uh, coming into Czechoslovakia in my lifetime, that was in 60, 1960, I think, was when that happened. I can still remember it. And um, I don't know, in, in the United States, I remember one time we thought something terrible was gonna happen. I don't remember what it was, but I went to the chiropractor and I said, I don't know what I'll do if uh, this does happen. The whole community was waiting for it to happen. I can't even remember what it was. It was pretty bad. I remember upset about it. And I went into the character and I said to him, you know, do if I can't come to you and have you that so much heavy work at that time. It was way back. I was clearing land six, seven hours a day. And he just said, no, it won't be a problem. Don't, I don't want you to think about it at all. And I said, why? He said, because you can just help us pick vegetables in the garden and you can come and do some hoeing and everything. If there's no money to pay, you're still going to get me to fix your back. <laughs> I thought, that's great. You know, because some people in that area, they weren't going to do anything for anybody. But if you don't help another person, why do you think you're going to get helped? That's the thing. Why do you think that someone should be helping you. And uh, we were raised in this one thing about my grandmother was, hmm, if you see a person fall down, you go and pick them up. You see an old person needs help, you stop and help them. If somebody you know, has an accident and you're the first one there and no one's around, you stop and you go see what you can do. You know, yeah. Oops. You're on mute. Huh. You're on mute. Uh, uh, yeah, that's yeah. right. There's, there's one other aspect of generosity which I think is very helpful. And, and it's the thing which is uh, what I could call generosity of spirit. Um, and it's something which uh, perhaps reflected when we, when we first went through lockdown and people were in a lot of, uh, some people were absolutely fine and some people were in a lot of distress uh, because they couldn't work or couldn't earn anything. And you'd, you'd meet two types of people. One who would say, you know, oh, you know, are you surviving? You know, are you okay? Uh, and, and implying the answer that they wanted. And then there'd be others who would simply say, how is it for you? And, you know, answer, asking an open question. And there's a generosity in an open question, which means that you then listen to somebody. And the listening is an enormously generous thing because whatever distress you're going through, if you feel that you've been heard, it, it's, a, it's a different place to be in. That's right. Uh, and, and so generosity is a, is a very wide ranging thing. 
Um, and it's, you know, Bhante and Ramsey will talk about, you know, the generosity of giving your smile away. Uh, you know, uh, and also it's this generosity of, of, of being open um, and being receptive, being listening. Uh, these are also important things. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, are we done? Okay. Yeah. We, I think that, that was now. really good. Yeah. Very good. So I want to thank our deacon for coming and visiting with us. Hope you come back again. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Sometimes we, we had sutras we were going to do, and this time we went off here. If you, if you don't want to spend a lot of time on these recollections, you need to just send me a note and tell me, because we had planned on doing um, some sutras, and we can go back to working with sutras in conjunction with the uh, index or things like that. There's lots of things we can do. So let me move this for a second. OK, here we go. Okay, here we go. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. Be beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, sister. It's a different bell. I get. I think I found.